brief history of early American decoration, wall and floor cloth stenciling, and the evolution of a career by Polly Forcier. Me. I didn't know it at the time, but my stenciling career began in 1969 when my mother, Mary Bradford Hill, gave me her book, Early American Decoration, by Esther Stevens Brazier, as well as her paint supplies and brushes. I was a young mother with three children at that time, but she hoped I would find a teacher of this art, and I did in Lillian Leto, who gave classes at the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen in Hanover, New Hampshire. I pay tribute to my mother because as parents or grandparents, we never know what small thing we do for or with our children will chart their careers. In later years, I named my business MB Historic Decor. The MB, as people ask, was to honor her, Mary Bradford. My first lessons began with country tin, which is the only truly American decoration of tin in our country. The other samples shown here originated in England and Wales, but were reproduced in this country by Esther Stevens Brazier and her devoted students, who established the Brazier Guild in her memory. The tin decorators were girls who traveled by sleigh or wagon and boarded with the tinsmith's family for a month or six weeks. They painted or flowered, as it was called, the pieces of tin by day. They were included in family life and social activities, dances, hay or sleigh rides, tea parties, spelling bees, and so forth. The two pieces on the left are a maple sugar mold and a syrup pitcher. You may notice I never finished the pitcher because I became involved with other things, but I still like it as it is. The two on the right are matchboxes. In the middle is the octagonal or coffin tray I submitted for applicant judging to the Historical Society of Early American Decoration. Thanks to my mother, in 1984, 15 years after she gave me her book, I was accepted into the Historical Society of Early American Decoration, otherwise known as HSEAD. One has to submit two trays showing many skills in country tin painting, including brush strokes and focal points, striping, and in stencil trays, gold and silver powder techniques. I thought I was never going to finish that tray. Some stenciled trays are called scenics. This scenic tray commemorates the first run of Stevenson's Liverpool to Manchester Railway in 1830. It shows bystanders watching the train go by. With reverse stencils, the image is bloomed around a solid instead of stenciled through a cutout as seen in the square. Here is a teaching tray, a display for the swan tray, which belonged to my teacher Lillian Leto. And here is what the completed tray looks like. This shows the sequential steps for recording from the old tray to reproduce onto another tray. These are tracings on clear acetate using a fine point indelible black pen. Magnets hold the acetate onto the tray while you trace the image. Next, these images are traced onto architect's linen and cut out with fine scissors or a number 11 scalpel, which is what I used. The third step is to proof the stencils individually by stenciling silver lining powders on black cardboard Duraglow and examining them closely for mistakes. Step four is to stencil the proposed tray onto black Duraglow, noting any changes that need to be made on the final tray. The final step is to transfer your practiced skills and technique to make a perfect tray. It is believed that many artisans worked on trays in an assembly line, some more skilled than others. In this tray, the corner stencils were not well executed on the original, but still copied by me for a side-by-side -side presentation with the original. There then follow coats and coats of varnish, each sanded lightly between applications, and a final rub down with oil and rotten stone pumice. Not our favorite thing to do. A bride's tray always has a white background. Gold leaf and silver leaf motifs and a special shade of bright green which is used for hand painted vines and leaves in fine detail. These flow from the flange to the floor of the tray. There are transparent colors applied over butterflies and some of the flowers. I made this tray for my daughter. And this is a snuffer tray. The original was reputed to have belonged to Thomas Jefferson. This is a gold leaf pattern from our nation's symbol. When the eagle's head is turned to its right, as it is here, it symbolizes peace. 
Turn to the left, it symbolizes death or war. Pierced or lace edged tray. This is the only type of painting where the rose petals are built up into ridges using wax added to the paint. You can see the lace edge. I gave this tray to my mother when it was done. Reverse painting on glass. As one paints on the glass, it will be a mirror image of what you painted when you turn it over. I once painted initials in gold leaf on glass, and when I turned it over, they were backwards. It's called reverse painting because sequentially it is the opposite of painting a picture. As you know, in painting a picture, you begin with a background and end with a detail in the foreground. In reverse painting, the artist starts with a foreground detail seen here in brown brush strokes and layer backwards what is first seen from the front until you end with a sky and water applied behind the entire painting on glass. The frames are tight to the subject and appropriately finished with a gold or silver leaf frame. This is a theorem on paper. It is the only one I ever tried. It was a prototype for a baby gift for my niece. Her name and birth date were inscribed by a calligrapher on the finished piece. This practice version allowed for examinations for mistakes. The arrow points to the error on the cup of the rose, which needed to be defined on its outer edge and which I corrected on the final theorem. When stenciling theorems on white velvet, HSEAD artisans often stain the background with tea to create the illusion of the aged theorems they are trying to replicate. Chairs and chair patterns are fun. Sheraton fancy chairs were common and used on paddle boats to seat patrons. This is one of a pair of Sheraton fancy chairs my mother and I saw in an antique shop. We decided on a gold leaf pattern, and when I finished decorating, they were a gift to her. This is a crown crest lyre back chair with rosewood graining, which you can see as red streaks beneath the stenciling to pretend that the chair was made from a more expensive wood than it actually was. There are five white water fountains on the slat, and there is a little swan underneath enjoying the shower. The gold powders have a tendency to fade over time. The Boston rocker belonged to my son Brad. Following are freehand bronze chair backs for yellow chairs. Artists in HSEAD make patterns either for their own purposes or to teach with. I never did either one of those with these patterns, but I intended to. On the right are mostly stenciled chair patterns. The one on the top is in gold leaf. The blue one is hand painted for a child's chair. These are bellow patterns, which I used in decorating a number of bellows. This turtleback bellows is domed like a turtle shell. This pattern was made with gold leaf and bronzing powders. Now for the fun stuff. It eclipses the more exacting disciplines. Fireboards and other primitives. The definition of primitive is created by an unschooled hand. Shown is an example of a very big fireboard I made to fit a large fireplace in our home in Norwich, Vermont, where I once lived. It's copied after Edward Hicks' painting Noah's Ark from 1846. It is somewhat in place at the Norwich Historical Society exhibition in 2016. To make the fireboard, my husband took three large boards from the attic floor and joined them together. I painted it in a week-long workshop at Linda Lefko's studio. Linda Lefko recently co-authored with Jane Radcliffe The Folk Art Murals of the Rufus Porter School, New England Landscapes, 1825 to 1845. It is the most recent research on the wall muralist's art from that period. More about Linda later. Above the mantel is a depiction of Moses Eaton wall stencils on canvas. Imagine the canvas lowered so that it rests on the mantel. That is how this stenciling on the wall would have appeared in a Moses Eaton stenciled room. In this example, wall stencils from a bedchamber were repeated onto a fireboard, which closed off its fireplace when not in use. The vase of flowers would have been purely decorative and set in an open fireplace in the summer. This piece is a copy of a Berks County, Pennsylvania, six-board unicorn dowry chest attributed to Christian Seltzer, circa 1797. The original was brought from the old country and came here with immigrants. The unicorn symbolized maidenly virtue. 
This pattern is from the Taunton Blanket Chest, designed by Robert Crossman, circa 1740. Here it is hand-painted with a tree of life, birds, and tulips on a wash stand. Bride's boxes originated in Germany and were brought here by immigrants. They were used for trinkets collected before marriage, like bits of lace, ribbon, hairbrush, thimble, and threads. This one is decorated with a primitive pussy cat, as someone spelled it. The bride's box on the left has tulips, which were a popular motif. The middle box is putty grained, and the box on the right is a copy of an authentic German bride's box. Now I am beginning a new venture, away from tinware and early American primitives, and onto walls and floors. The Valley News came to photograph me in my studio in 1984. This was right after I joined the HSEAD in Albany. I never did any more work in that realm. In fact, on my way home, I stopped at the HSEAD Museum and copied all the wall and floor stencils in their archives. Wall stenciling was not new to me. I was brought up in the Monadnock region of New Hampshire, which was a mecca for Eaton stencils and murals in the Rufus Porter School of Wall Painting. I held a parallel interest to decorating tinware in wall stencils since 1970. That was the year I wanted to decorate our 1790 farmhouse with wallpaper, but could not afford it. Just like homeowners of old, I turned to stenciling for the same reason. I reached out to Jessica Bond, a renowned researcher of wall stenciling, and she sent me the stencil I found in a book, Early American Stencils by Janet Waring. Some years later, an aging Jess invited me to join her in her research. I carried the ladder and traced high and low stencils. Eventually, she retired and sent me instead. We exchanged many tracings and comparisons, and she became my mentor. By the mid-80s, I had started a little cottage industry called Loveland Stencils. In those days, we cut all our stencils by hand using X-Acto knives. I taught wall stenciling in my studio and wall stenciling and floor cloths at Fletcher Farm School for the Arts and Crafts. Stenciling directly onto a floor creates the effect of inlaid wood or carpet. This is the floor in my dining room. The stencils, taken from the Humphreys house in Dorchester, Massachusetts from around 1790, emulate a woven carpet. Stenciling was an inexpensive and decorative way to imitate an actual, more expensive carpet. Here is the entryway to my home. Diamond and square stencils were an early popular design to imitate more valuable marble. The diamond floor stencil is from the Stratton Tavern in Northfield, Massachusetts. The advent of websites and laser cutting enabled me in 1993 to launch my business, MB Historic Decor. We produced three catalogs of authentic historic stencils that I had traced and we made available on laser cut mylar along with paints, brushes, and supplies so that people could purchase them and decorate their homes themselves. The first three catalogs were of border wall stencils, floor stencils, and the Moses Eaton collection. Later, I produced three more catalogs and can offer more than 700 historic stencils. A wall stencil sampler of New England, the Rufus Porter School of Wall Mural Painting, and Victorian Stencil Collection. Two Dartmouth grads created and maintained my first website for $50. In 1996, I developed an interest in Rufus Porter mural painting and traveled to Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Vermont, most often in the company of my friend Linda Lefko, for her to document and I to trace Porter stencils. Porter and his students, primarily Jonathan Poor, his nephew, painted many murals of the New England countryside, which are highly prized today. I created two DVDs. The Rufus Porter School of Wall Mural Painting shows the inside of 10 New Hampshire houses with Rufus Porter stencils. The image quality is rather poor because I didn't know what I was doing, and it was before cell phones, but you can still get the pleasure seeing the murals. The second shows how to paint a mural in the Rufus Porter style. In these days, we went to a lot of conventions. These photos are from our first Sally Convention in California. That stands for a Stencil Artisans League Incorporated. This is my daughter, Vivian Bisbee, and my son, Ken Forcier. Vivian now owns MB Historic Decor. She is available for consultation to decorate or make floor cloths. 
and my son has made his living with his company, Gracewood Design. He makes custom floor cloths for individuals, creates huge floor cloths like the Hay House in Macon, Georgia, and St. Paul's Cathedral in Hartford, Connecticut, and his floor cloths are in a shop at Harrods in London. Here is another booth of ours, this time in the King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, where we went many times. The booth looked different every time. Our stencils were hanging on racks so people can look at and purchase them, and they can also see the floor cloth designs and panels of walls that they can create in their own homes. This is a costume of Dominotier. In France, early tradesmen walked the streets wearing advertising for their wares. The men wore a top hat. I had had a flood in my basement which ruined the sample canvases I displayed at trade shows. I cut out the good parts and my friend Barbara Holland made this advertising costume. When I moved to Queechy, Vermont in 2000, I began work redecorating the condominium I had purchased. Nothing had been upgraded since it had been built in 1984. It was still a golfer's getaway with a green carpet like a putting green. I arrived with all these early American decorated items and antique furniture and needed to redo the interior to be the appropriate background for the furnishings. I ripped out the green carpet and 4-inch baseboards and put in 6-inch baseboards with a molding on top. I added chair rails and crown molding at the ceiling, added hardwood floors, and smoothed out the popcorn ceiling. Then I stenciled the walls and floors. I pitched the idea of a Colonial Condominium article to an editor I knew. She thought it was a good idea, and out of that came this magazine, Colonial Reproductions and Designs, in which I was featured in 16 pages. The cover shows the living room and part of the dining room of my condominium. Over the years, I either wrote articles for or was written about in these magazines. People decorated with stencils because they couldn't afford imported wallpapers from England and France, which were highly taxed. Artisans traveled by horseback or on foot, pulling or pushing a wheeled cart with all their supplies, dried colored pigments, homemade brushes, and stencils. When they found a client, they stayed with that family and acquired from them the milk or eggs needed to mix the paint. They were paid very little, but painted for room and board. This is a sample board of the Marshland Farm in Queechy, Vermont. Here you see it used in my hallway. I was tipped off that the old stenciled walls at Marshland Farm were to be painted over the next day, so I rushed over and recorded the frieze, uprights, and horizontals just in time. This is a classical design, more formal, inspired by architectural features, carved woodwork, or columns. It imitated the English taste earlier than Moses Eaton, from about 1790 to 1820. You can see how stenciling frames and enhances whatever is hanging on a wall. Here my volunteers and I stencil the kitchen in David's house, which is a home away from home for families of children who are undergoing medical procedures at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in Hanover, New Hampshire. The swag stencils shown here are from East Montpelier, Vermont, chosen because they imitated the classical style used in the living room and mimicked the mirror motif. The design imitates carved plaster or woodwork which you may have seen carved on the outside of colonial houses. My friends the Finers really love stenciling and we did a lot of it in their little Cape Cod house in Norwich, Vermont. The stencils in the front hall along the stairs are from the Jacob Randall House of Pownall, Maine and these are from the Daniel Kingsbury House in Brookfield, Vermont. Their dining room stencils come from the Colonel White Farm in Buckfield, Maine. In the Norwich Post Office, I reproduced stencils that were found in the Elihu Carpenter House in Norwich, Vermont from about 1810. In my own house is a stencil from the Leavenworth Denison House in Hinesburg, Vermont. I'll share a story of this house later on. In the dining room are stencils from the Dutton House in Shelburne Museum. The house was moved to the museum from Cavendish, Vermont. The guest room has stencils from the Benjamin Richardson Tavern in Sterling, Massachusetts. This is a dining room in Woodstock, Vermont, showing stencils from the Sage House in South Sandusfield, Mass. That house burned down. So many houses have burned or been lost to time, paint, or wallpaper. We get very excited if we find any vestiges of stencils remaining today. Please see reference at the end to report any original stenciling to the Center for the Preservation of Wall Painting, founded by Linda Lefko. 
The Center for Painted Wall Painting Preservation is a nonprofit involved in conserving and documenting paint decorated plaster from 1790 to 1860. A hallway I stenciled in Quichy, Vermont with Moses Eaton stencils. In 2014, Sturbridge Village lent the White House to the HSEAD for displaying our work and storing our patterns. Here Maureen Morrison, Ginny O'Brien, and I are decorating the main room with Moses Eaton stencils. Restoring stenciling in historic houses is my favorite thing to do. I'll tell you some stories. This was an advertisement for my shop in the Bridgewater Mill. Soon after I moved to Queechy, my son Brad, who was living in Killington, suggested I open a shop in the Bridgewater Mill. It was a little windowless cubicle, and the walls cried out for stenciling, which Brad did for me. We opened the MB Historic Decor Shop in 2003 under the honor system. One day I arrived there to find Ray and Joyce Jorgensen perusing the Moses Eaton stencils. They owned the original Moses Eaton homestead on the Dublin Harrisville, New Hampshire town line. Years ago, this original kit belonging to Moses Eaton was found under the eaves in their attic. This is how we have identified the name Moses Eaton with his stenciled walls. The Jorgensons were ecstatic as they were finding all the stencils they needed to reproduce the stenciling in the left front room where an original old sooty wall panel remained behind the entry door. I offered to help them and we did it together. Ray found an old board painted a strong salmon color in the back shed, which seemed to have been a sample of the original wall color. Ray took the board to be matched in flat latex paint and then painted the four walls. Joyce was aghast at the bright effect, but she was a good sport and went along with it. Ray, the engineer, did all the measuring, and when I came with paints and brushes, we all and our daughters got to work. The overall pattern in imitation of wallpaper covers over almost one quarter of the background color with red and green motifs and minimizes the effect of four bright walls all reflecting one another in the sunlight. The family with grandchildren drifted through as we worked and each grandchild got to stencil one unit behind the couch. Old House Interiors featured an article by Catherine Cyberling Pond chronicling our process and final triumph and Joyce loved the finished result. I said I'd tell you a story about the Denisons I'd mentioned before. The Leavenworth Denison House is in Hinesburg, Vermont. The Denisons are friends of ours who indulged our irrepressible habit of picking off the wallpaper behind the living room door for over 20 years before a steamer was rented and the work began. Here, four layers of wallpaper had to be removed to reveal the stenciling underneath Several original panels have been preserved under glass. It is always a travesty to paint over original stenciling, but sometimes you simply can't live with it. It was over 200 years old. The rest of the room was painted a shell pink with gray bands like the original. The urns had remained visible and were a feature over the mantelpiece as well as replaced along the baseboard. This is the Jewett Marlins House in Alstead, New Hampshire, 1996. Historic houses are usually called by two names. The first indicates the original owner and the second the present owner. Steve Marlins, an architectural historian, discovered that wallboard walls covered the original walls. In peeking behind, he found Moses Eaton stenciling, which he exposed. One whole wall was gone and he wanted that replaced and the damage to other walls repaired to match the remaining walls which were in good condition. The first job was to replace the wall and then match the original background paint. He ordered several strong shades of yellow milk paint. We were quite sure we had it with the choice of a bright school bus yellow, but it was still wrong. In a flash of brilliance, Steve scooped up a handful of 200-year-old soot and dirt and rubbed it over the new paint. Voila! We obtained the color. The new wall was such a perfect match that the magazine photographer mistakenly used it as an example of the original wall. On the old Queechy Road, not far from the Queechy Inn at Marshland Farm, a house also has original stenciling of the classical style. It was mostly in excellent condition, but the owners wanted parts of it restored. They also opened up a wall and added the next room to the living room space and wanted those walls to look like the original stenciling. 
An artist imitated the old look of the background and then I repaired in the old room and reproduced the old stencils in the new room to be a seamless transition. In Guilford, Vermont, there were vestiges of these stencils that could be seen on the old walls, and I was able to trace them, but I also had them in my collection. It's an old federal house. You can see the stencils sometimes misalign, the one color with another. Today, stencils are cut from transparent mylar, but originally, most artisans cut their stencils from brown paper, heavily varnished to stiffen it, and they could not see how to accurately align the second color with the first. This is the Salmon Wood House in Hancock, New Hampshire. They discovered a bubble of paint, and under the bubble they saw there was some stenciling, so they contacted me. Using super sticky tape, I was able to pull off enough paint to record it, and then reproduce the stencil. The stenciling was of the most sophisticated of the time, exhibiting five colors in the swag. At least four rooms were stenciled in this house. The strong colors are correct. That is how they were. The 1863 Parker House in Queechy once had historic stenciling in the hallway, as shown in the Victorian catalog. This mural represents the Norwich Military Academy, which was originally in Norwich, Vermont. The parade grounds stood where the Norwich Elementary School is now. The rivalry between the cadets and Dartmouth students caused a prank to get out of hand, and the Dartmouth boys burned down the academy building. The adults realized this rivalry was never going to end, so in 1866, the Military Academy moved to Northfield, Vermont. I painted this mural in the Rufus Porter style. It is in the oldest house in Norwich, which is depicted on the hill on the right-hand side. I used an historic print from the Norwich Historical Society for a reference to the gates and fencing of the parade ground and to locate the church. Two boys lived in the house at that time. One loved horses and the other loved dogs, so both are incorporated in the mural using Rufus Porter stencils. In my own house, I made a mock-up for the Bob Vila Speck House on the Cape. He talked to me about creating a mural for it when he was in Queechy doing some work on a speck house on Willard Road. So I mocked it up on my own wall. It isn't quite like this on the finished wall, but it was something I had to practice so I knew what I was doing when I got there. Here is a copy of a Porter wall once in the Prescott Tavern in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. I used Porter's own paint formula from his little book, Curious Arts. It began with rabbit skin glue as the binder, and into that slurry I dissolved powdered pigments. The buildings are recently identified as being the White House. For many years, it was thought to be Dartmouth College. The face of the sun rising over the mountain is a symbol of knowledge. The frame was grained using a large, stiff, primary feather from a turkey's wing. Floor cloth workshops have been a lot of fun. I have taught them since 1984. The following are some of the end results of the classes. I won't be teaching many more workshops, but mbhistoricdecor.com offers several stencil suggestions for making 2x3 canvas floor cloths and has all the supplies needed with directions. Vivian Bisbee is there to help. I will make a YouTube demonstration that will guide you in making your first one, and I am confident you can then move on to figuring different sizes and patterns. This was a workshop at Artistry in South Pomfret, Vermont. Susan Roberts used stencils from the May House. Ann Quasman used the hit-or-miss pattern from the Alan Kirk Roberts House in Moodus, Connecticut. This is definitely the easiest pattern I have. It doesn't have any measuring to do. You just put the stencils where you want them to go. She did another floor cloth with stencils from the Edward Durant House in Newton, Massachusetts. A lot of them have yellow ochre backgrounds, which is not a specific color. It's just any deep yellow. It's like the old floors called pumpkin pine on which people stenciled. It has a softening effect to use strong colors on top of yellow instead of on white, which gives more contrast. I don't know her name, but she and Jessica Melville had fun adding an unconventional streak to the interlocking circles pattern from the Isaac Buck House in Hanover, Massachusetts. This is Jessica Melville again with another floor cloth from the Edward Durant House in Newton, Massachusetts. Students felt confident to tackle larger canvases and different patterns for their second go-round. This is the Wayside Inn Tulip pattern from Sudbury, Massachusetts. The May House stencils from Woodstock, Connecticut is a popular choice. And this student had wonderful fun with color using the Edward Durant House stencils from Newton, Massachusetts. 
You would never have seen such a combination historically, but we loved it and thought she did a wonderful job. Last of all is a Rufus Porter style floor cloth from a workshop in China Lake, Maine. If this has inspired you to try your hand at stenciling walls, floors, or floor cloths, we at MB Historic Decor can supply you with guidance and supplies. Here is the link to our website and other resources that you might find helpful.